If I unmute myself, good morning. It's so good to see all your beautiful faces. If you will, stand and join us as we sing. I think we all have something to sing about today because we serve a living God. Oh. Uh -huh. 
me in prayer, if you would. Father God, as we stand before you today, we truly do stand amazed at your presence. How much you love us and how well you know us. You know all about us. You know our thoughts, you know our actions, you know, you know us, Lord. and yet you still love us. Father, I thank you that you have called us to be your children, and because of that, we're to walk with you and to, um, to enjoy fellowship with you every single day. Help us, Lord God, to, to shine out then as lights in this community, to be difference makers for your kingdom, for, Lord, you've made all the difference in our lives. I pray that today our minds will be focused on you, and our hearts will be receptive to what you want to say. In the blessed name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let me welcome you this morning. We're glad you're here. Don't forget, on the, in the bulletin there is that little tear-out. If you have some special prayer requests or some concerns that you would want to voice to us that we might pray about or talk with you about, just um, tear that off, fill it out, and place it in the offering boxes on the way out. And we'll, uh, we'll go over those uh, every week. Uh, other items are listed there. I trust you take time to read those over. Uh, Marsh and I had a great trip. Several of you have asked about our trip. Uh, we were at Michigan. We were staying with Dan and Beth for uh, some of the time that we were there. Some of you remember Dan and Beth Carr. Uh, we were at their house, and uh, we got to do lots of different things. Um, Went to the old cider mills, you know, as, as you would, where they're doing the apples in the corn maze. And um, we went on a hike up into um, Sleeping Bear Dunes. It's up north of uh, north and west of Traverse City. Some of you Michiganders or know about that part of the world. Um, and it was, it was great. Uh, but the weather was, was stellar. When we were there, most of it was, was sunshine and got into the low 70s a few days. Um, when we left, it was 32 in Grand Rapids, and it was about 35 in Traverse City where we were, and it was spitting rain. It might have been snow, but it was spitting rain, I think. Um, so it was certainly good to get back and to the beautiful sunshine we had here. But what a privilege it is, isn't it, to gather together to praise the one and true living God and, be, and really be amazed of his love for you and I. Let's continue worshiping together as we acknowledge the coming king. Stand if you will.
you are dismissed. As you think of the story there of the Lord Jesus, and you think how he lived his life and then how he went to the cross for you and I, and that's what we were just singing about, isn't it? How he went to the cross, was dead, buried, and then he rose from the grave. And um, after that happens, I want to just read a, a, just a short passage here out of a Matthew 28. So the resurrection's happened. The women have gone to the tomb now, and um, he's gone. He's no longer there. And then there's the story that the guards tell. And, and then I want to pick it up at verse 16 in Matthew 28. It said, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Now, remember 11, Judas has already committed suicide at this time. He's gone. So the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I don't think that this this great commission, we call it, was just for those 11. I think that's what the Lord would say to all of us. And, and the, in the text there, in the Greek, it's, it's as you're going, make disciples. So he already expects us to be out there going, sharing the truth of God's word around us. So as you're going, making disciples. And, and so we need to be about, outside of these walls, going and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ who lives in me. I am crucified with Christ.
Come trace the steps the Savior walked for you. to um, thank Pastor Jimmy for last Sunday. I haven't had a chance yet to listen to the message, but everybody tells me how great it was and good stuff, and, uh, and for Laura. While we were up there looking at all the beautiful leaves, you know, and all the things, uh, I do appreciate uh, Jimmy's, uh, Pastor Jimmy's hard work in keeping up with stuff that's going on around here. But today I want to start a, a new series, and I want to start it out of the, the book of Luke, and I'm going to kind of call it Lessons from Luke. Um, Luke, as you know, was a doctor, and most of you probably understand it. He was a doctor, uh, therefore he was well-educated. He was uh, an intellectual, if you will. And as you read about Luke, you find out his literary styles was very, very similar to the, the uh, classical Greek historians that were writing at the time. And we have different historians that wrote during that time. Josephus, a Jewish historian of the classical Greeks, and so we kind of know his, his writing style. Uh, he was a good researcher, and he was very meticulous in his research. I mean, he, he didn't just hear it. I mean, he really investigated it. But then he took all this research, and, and he would arrange it in such a way, these facts, that, that made it very readable uh, for us to understand. I uh, like Chuck Swindoll uh, uh, said this. He has the mind of a scientist, the pen of a poet, and the heart of an artist. That's pretty good, you know, but he can really turn a phrase, so that, that, that's great. Um, his good friend was Paul. You know, they were close together. In fact, is uh, you're going to find that um, he is with Paul very close to the end of Paul's life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. But Luke was there, but just Luke. You know, he hung out with Paul. He was close to him. He writes the Gospel of Luke, I think, uh, probably in the early 60s. There's some discussion on that, and I tried to read all the different angles and things about it. But I think, for me, and I think the evidence would say in the early 60s is when he writes this. Now, there's lots of ways of looking at the book of Luke, how we could describe it and break it down and all that. But I think a, a fascinating way is the way that, that Luke wrote. He wrote um, geographically. He wrote from Jesus, from the north, going to the south. And as he goes, he's talking about the kingdom. And he's inviting people and urging people to come and join and be part of the kingdom. So that's how I want us to look at it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip all the north stuff, all right, um, from Galilee and all the parts of that that happened. And we're going to track it on down till he gets down to, um, coming on down further down to the Perea area as he's on his way to Jerusalem. So that's kind of where we want to go with it. And as Jesus is going, understand now, he's traveled, he's done all this teaching in the north, and he's, he's always heading down, and he's going to end up in Jerusalem, as you know. But he goes through all these little villages and all these little towns. And one of the neat things on our trip was we drove around in Michigan, and there would be all these little towns, and, and, you know, and the only thing they would have maybe in this town was Pumpkins everywhere, you know, or something like that. Because I mean, millions of pumpkins up there, um, and some of them, some of these little hammocks and, and towns would be decorated with all kinds of, of, of corn stalks. And I mean, it was really huge in that area. Fall, it just is, and and the colors were brilliant, 
this year. Um, they said better than they had in many, many years. And so we just happened to hit it at the right time, the right place. Everything just clicked for us. Some of the towns, one of the towns we went to had like, I don't know where they, like scarecrows. They had tied on these posts. It was really creepy. I mean, it was, they, their faces had kind of worn off. And it was just like, you know, it was, it was we, we drove quickly through that little community, uh, you know, children of corn or something. But anyway, think of Jesus now walking through these little villages, in these little towns, as he's on his way from the north, heading down eventually to Jerusalem. And I want to pick it up then in, in, in Luke chapter 13. We're going to start at verse 22 because that's the break. That's where we're going to go into a new section of further south. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 13, and uh, I'll start reading at verse 22. And you can just keep your Bibles open there because we're going to kind of refer back to that passage of Scripture. Then Jesus went through the towns and the villages, teaching as he, as he made his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able they'd be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. And then you will say, We ate and drank with you and, and, taught in our, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. And there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and the first will be last. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this passage of Scripture, um, God, may we just be very honest with your Scripture. May we allow truth to speak to our hearts. So often, God, we'd want to go on our own instincts, and so often they're wrong. So help us to listen to your blessed Holy Spirit now. Um, and not worry about the person next to us right this moment, but teach us what you want to say. In the blessed name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So somebody comes up with a question, and they say, hey, Jesus, how many people are going to get into heaven? You know, how many people are going to make it there? And so Jesus now takes this teaching opportunity to share some truths, and that's what I want us to kind of look at. So if you're filling out your little uh, a bulletin there, um, you might fill out the first one. It says, not as many as you think. How many are going to make it to heaven? Not as many as you think. Well, then how few? How many are going to make it? Well, in verse 24, he says it's a narrow door. In Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, it says this. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The mainstream of people try to get into heaven through the wide door. That's what he's saying here. In fact is, I would submit that most people think, I'm going to get there. They expect it. I'm going to make it to heaven. Well, sure, why wouldn't I? God's a God that loves it. Everybody, I've read that, I've heard that. So, yeah, we're all going to make it there. Well, what, you know, so what's the definition of the wide door, or the wide gate? Use the same word used different ways there. And here it is, the working definition we're going to use, is that any other way than Jesus Christ and him alone is a wide door, wide gate. Any other way than Jesus Christ and him alone. So here's the wide door is being good, going to church, being kind, Thinking positive thoughts about God. And let me tell you, most people try the wide gate. In John chapter 10, verse 9. Yes, I am the gate, and those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastors. He said, I'm the gate. And you recall how they would do the, um, sometimes they would do a, 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 a sheep pen, or where they would pen up the, the sheep, and they would have this, room like this and the door would be there but there would be no door and the shepherd would lay down and sleep there 
So if any sheep were getting out, they had to crawl over top of him or anybody trying to get in would have to come through him. And Jesus said, wait a minute, guys, I'm the good shepherd. I am the door. You have to come through me to come in. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Through me. Now, go back to that for just a moment. He says, I am the way. What way? I am the way for salvation. I am the way to heaven. But not only is Jesus the way to get to heaven, but he's also the way to live. I'm the way you're supposed to do life. You have heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Pray for those. Do good to those who persecute you. You say this, and Jesus says, but I say unto you, forgive your enemies. Go through Matthew 5, 6, 7, all the time. And, and I love those phrases. You've heard it said, but I say, what's he saying? But I am telling you a new way. Not this way, but this way. Your world, your culture says live this way, but I say live this way. And how did Jesus do it? All the way through the cross. So he's hanging on the cross, and what does he do? Say, you rascals. No, he said, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. He forgives them. So when Jesus says, I am the way, it's the way of salvation, but it's also the way that we're to live in a culture that is anti-God. But this is the way we're to live, to forgive one another, to love one another, to speak truth in love to one another. See? And so that's what he says there. Um, so how many people are going to get to heaven? Well, not as many as you think. I, I like how uh, Daryl Brock in his book wrote this. This principle, listen to this, this is pretty good. This principle is fundamental in a culture that argues that there are many ways to God, as if the road to heaven is a complex interstate highway system which offers dozens of routes and interchanges. <laughs> Isn't that our culture? I mean, that's it. Let me tell you, there is no other way. That's what he says here. So John, or so excuse me, Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 1 John 5.12. Whoever has the Son of Life has whoever has the Son has life, whoever is not the Son of God has not life. So how many are going to get to heaven? Not as many as you think. Secondly, there are no second chances. There are no second chances. He says in, in verse 25, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. He said the door is closed. And it reminds you, doesn't it, of um, go way back in the Old Testament when everybody was doing what they wanted to do? And it was so grievous unto God that he said, I'm going to destroy the world by a flood, except for Noah, his family. And God shuts the door. And let me tell you, when those floods came, you think there were people knocking on the door of that boat? I, I doesn't say that in the scripture, but I got to believe there were people banging on the door. Hey, Noah! Let us in. Come on. This is, this is getting ways deep out here. Man, this is getting rough. You know us, Noah. And they couldn't get in. And they couldn't sneak in. But a lot of people think they're going to find a way into heaven. Because all their lives they've been able to fake it. And they've been successful. And they've always been able to get out of it. Whatever the problem, whatever, it's always come up and they've always done okay. And so they think, you know what, when I die and I stand before God, I don't know how, but I know some way, somehow, I'm going to find a way in. That's just how I am. I know it. It's going to happen. But Jesus says, when the door is shut, it's all over. That's it. There's no pleading my case. There's no second chances. It's done. 
So what's the implication for you and I? We better be sure of our personal salvation because I'll tell you, none of us know how long we're going to live. None of us do. And once we're gone, there is no second chance. There's no, I'm going to hang out in purgatory for a while and I'm going to get in. That's not true. The Bible never teaches that. Once the door's shut, it's shut. And none of us know that day, do we? So we better make sure. Well, how many are going to get to heaven? Number three, close but no cigar. That's, that's for uh, all you uh, Spurgeon fans who used to smoke a cigar. Close but no cigar. Verse 26 and 27. Notice what the text tells us. And then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. They're going to say, but Jesus, wait a minute. We hung out together. You remember me? Come on. We, you know, we went down to here. We had a glass of wine together. We hung out. We, you know who I am, remember? He says, depart from me. So what's that mean today? Today it's, hey, wait a minute. I went to Parkland. I went to Sunday school. I was a deacon. I was a teacher. When they used to have a choir, I sang in it. You know, I know the Bible. And here's the thinking process. If I'm in the right place, at the right time, hanging out with the right people, then I'm in. And the Bible says you're not. Close. But you are not. So then the question comes, when did you receive Jesus as your Savior? When did you step across the line from knowing about Him to knowing Him, and receiving Him, and becoming a follower of Him? When was the time that you made that commitment and He is a personal relationship with the Savior? Because just going to church all your life, and I don't care if it's Baptist, Episcopalian, whatever. Just going to church all your life or hanging around godly people won't get you into heaven. It just simply won't. <coughs> Excuse me. A passing acquaintance with God is not the same thing as knowing God. And that's what these people had. He is the door. It's great you hang around with the right kind of people. That's not going to get you to heaven. But my mom and dad are Christians, or my parents were, or I grew up. It doesn't matter. That's not going to get you to heaven. Well, the next thing out of our passage, I think he teaches us here about people going to heaven, is the awfulness of hell. So fill that one in. Number four, the awfulness of hell. Verse 28. If you've got your Bible still open, look at verse 28. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. And when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself are thrown out. Now remember the first question, the original question that came up? Someone asked, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? That was the question. So what has happened now? It's a quantum leap from that question to hell and the discussion of hell. Let me ask you this. And I mentioned this to a couple people earlier. When you know somebody, you know, you know them, and you think, you know what, this person's probably not going to make it to heaven. You know, I don't think they're going to get there. What's that really mean? Because the only other place is hell. That's the only other place. That means that's what you think about. But we don't like to talk about hell, do we? We don't like to think about hell. Because hell is real, and it is awful, and it is forever. We don't like to think that way. The little passage that 
maybe we'll get to eventually. It's in Luke 16. Let me just read a couple of verses there. Start at verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, or nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let them warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of what? Torment. So the rich man is saying, Hell is awful. It's, it's, it's torment. It's torture. Please tell my brothers, let them know they got to go through the narrow way. I don't want them to ever end up in what I'm in. So please tell them. See, nobody wants to hear about hell. They just don't. But Christians need to hear about hell. If you're here this morning, you're, Christians need to realize how bad hell is. So we don't offer Jesus like some little comforting blanket or something. Well, if you want to try him on, okay. And if you don't, okay. It's, you know, he's just going to be this little buddy next to you. The reality is, without Jesus Christ, a person will spend eternity in hell. And we need to warn him. We need to warn them. I heard an illustration. And they said, what happens if you were standing and you saw somebody, they didn't see you were sitting, you looked out the window, you saw them cutting the brake lines of a car. And then you saw them leave, and then somebody come out and get ready to drive the car. You'd want to go out and tell them, whoa, 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 wait a minute, don't get in this car, because that's disaster. Not trying to scare them into heaven, but people need to know the truth. There's heaven and there's hell. I'm not trying to frighten anybody, oh, you know. I just tell you, this is the truth, this is the facts. And as a Christian, we need to do that. We need to be sharing the truth. Jesus isn't just some little warm blanket. If you want him, fine. If you don't, fine. It's okay. Everything's fine. Life's great. Let's all hum and sing together. The reality is heaven and hell. So Christians, we need to hear about hell. But non-Christians need to know. Why do they need to know? So they can make an informed decision. Boy, we talk a lot about it today, don't we? Oh, we want all the data. You know, you have to have all the data to make a decision. Well, let me tell you, non-believers, non-Christians need to have the data. They need to have the truth. It's not a complex highway going to heaven. There's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ. Someone said, if you could spend five seconds in hell, our lives would be completely different. Completely. Because we'd know the awfulness of hell. Well, number five, fifth thing. The scope of the saved. The scope of the saved. People will come, says verse 29, people will come from east and west, north and south, and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now to the Jews, this was like, what? <laughs> this is a surprise. You know, I, others are going to be there? And, and it kind of reminds me, you've heard this story, I know, but it's great. I like it. And, and then, so the person dies and he goes to heaven and, and St. Peter's walking him around. And he says, uh, you see that group of people there? They're Episcopalian. Follow Jesus, though. They knew Christ as Savior. That group over there, oh, that, that's the Methodist. You know, and, and they're there. And they're there. And, oh, there's some frozen chosen Presbyterians, you know. He said, yeah, they're here, you know, and they're having a great time. And, and goes through that. And then the guy said, well, what is the group over there behind those trees? What group's that? They said, wow, that's the Baptist, but shh, they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> and sometimes that's how we think. But it says in a text, they will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south, and they will take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because it's talking about people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Not in a denomination, not in anything else, but in Christ and Him alone. He is the door, not the church. Now, He died for the church, and the church is the body of Christ, and that's a whole other story. But Christ is the way. Not by being good and doing all those other things that so many people think. That's the wide path. It's through Christ and Him alone. That's why we as a church are so concerned for missions for all people. 
people from every social economic background. It doesn't matter if they're street people or if they're president and CEOs of major companies. Because we want to be ministering to all people, all social economic levels, all races, all people, because all people matter to God. Everyone does. And then they ought to matter to us. It doesn't matter their lifestyle. They should matter to us so that we might tell them of Christ so they might know Jesus and have their life changed. So it's kind of interesting. Who's going to get to heaven? Probably some people you don't really think so. <laughs> but we're not the only ones. Others from east and west and north and south. And number six, the last one. Awards ceremony. Look at verse 30. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and the first shall be last. Now, Jesus teaches this throughout the scriptures, doesn't he? That the greatest shall be your servant, that the first will be the last, and the last will be the first. And he kind of does that whole upside-down kind of thing. So when you get to heaven, uh, you may be surprised who gets the rewards and who's way back in the back of the line. And you say, well, I thought they were always super Christian, but they're way back here. And, and this little person here, I didn't know, but... Man, they're the faithful follower of God. They're way up here. See, I don't know how that's going to all work out. But let me tell you this this morning. Kind of wrap this thing up if I can. Just find God's mission in your life and follow it with passion. You know? Just, just follow it with passion. Um, uh, what was his name? Not Blackberry. Um, anyway, Black of B, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about finding what God is doing and get right in the middle of it, that's kind of the idea there. Find God's mission in your life and then follow it. And it doesn't matter how insignificant it seems to others. Don't worry about what the other people are thinking about it and judging you and looking at you and all that jazz. You find what God wants you to do, and man, then go after it. Then do it. Follow him. Well, the question in our story then changes. Started out, will the saved be few? And I want to turn that, will the saved be you? Will the saved be you? Chuck Swindoll summarizes this whole passage of Scripture. It's only he can do it in four quick sentences. Truth is not popular. The offer expires. The consequences of rejection are terrifying, but the rewards are eternal. That's pretty good, isn't it? I probably should have just read that and sat down. But, but you know, I don't, know, no, I don't need those amens. It's okay. But let's be real honest here. Are you still trying the wide way? Are you still trying that to just be good? Or I'll find a way. I always do. Or... Maybe I'll just keep coming to church and hang around with people and it'll just rub off and that'd be good. Or hell isn't really real. I think that's just imaginary. And if it is, it can't be all that bad. Or salvation is for just people like us. So let's have our own holy huddle here because we like each other. And let's not worry about the rest who are on their way to hell. Remember what I read earlier today? We called it the Great Commission. That we are to go into all the world to make disciples by sharing Jesus' love, by teaching, by being examples of who Christ is. Won't you do that this week? Won't you allow God? Because let me tell you, it's real, folks. Life and death, heaven and hell hang in the balance. I guess the most important question then this morning would be, are you sure you know Christ as your Savior? Don't buy into, I'll just fake it till I make it, because you never make it. You've got to trust Him as your Savior, as your Lord. And I know this because we record this sometimes, that we put it on YouTube and, and other people see this. And if you happen to be one of those people, maybe the day is today for you receive Christ as Savior. And if that's true, just shoot us off an email at our church here at Parkland. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and, and maybe follow up on that with you. But 
everybody needs to first check out that we know for sure, for sure, for sure that we belong to Christ. Not because we're good, because we're all lost, but because we've trusted him to be our Lord and Savior. And then secondly, let's go about living his mission. Let's have a passion about our living for Christ. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word to us today. And as we started this little series together on lessons from Luke, may this be our first lesson. There is a broad way and there's a narrow way. And that Jesus, you are the only way and the truth and life. But no one is going to ever come to heaven, enter into heaven, without first knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And I pray if there's some here today who are not sure, uh, that today they would make sure by just turning from their sin and trusting in you. And there'll be rejoicing in heaven. So many here in this auditorium I know are believers. But I pray, Lord, that we will be encouraged to live out our faith, maybe more boldly, maybe stronger, as we realize the wonderfulness of heaven and the awfulness of hell. And the time is short. The harvest is, is ready. It's white. Send us now, Lord, into your fields to be difference makers for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, and as we sing together, understand that God's got a place for you. And maybe you just want to come to him today. Maybe you want to come to the altar and say, Lord, I'm a Christian, but I want to follow you. I want to have a passion for following you. Or maybe it's the first time to truly trust in him. Or whatever the decision, let's honor him as we sing together. for all of this. You know, all over, all people, there's room. Jesus invites everyone to come to him. Don't forget, if you want to fill out that little uh, tab in the back of the bulletin there, maybe some special prayer requests or other information you want to give to us, don't forget to fill that out. Just place it on your way out in one of the um, offering boxes in the back. And we'll be praying for you or contact you, whatever it might be. Or maybe just someone you know just want us to pray for them, that they don't know Christ. Whatever it is, we want to just honor him, don't we, with the way that we live. Now, let's have a sense of, of joy as we sing together before we leave. Prepare yourselves to spread the tidings, y'all.
Jesus saves. Sing with us. as we leave this place now, we go in the power of your blessed Holy Spirit. May we share the joy and the love of knowing Jesus Christ with those around us, that God, uh, the, path works, uh, the paths of who we're going to cross this week. Lord, help us to be sensitive to those promptings and urgings of your blessed Holy Spirit to share Jesus of a lost and dying world. I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Don't forget to put your mask on. Sing and try